For part two, we're going to look at just the S and bone reactions. So we are going to look at the order of reactivity of all seven substrates under conditions for the SN1 reaction. So for the SN1 reactions, the setup is exactly the same as it was for the SN2. We are adding five drops of each reagent into the test tubes. And I basically fast forwarded through this. So we essentially added one milliliter of our silver nitrate in the solvent ethanol. And what we found, so this essentially was the stop point um, just after we added our one milliliter to the two chloro, two methyl propane. So this reaction set actually went substantially faster than our SN2 reaction. So with this, since we had that silver nitrate essentially assisting our leaving group and being a better leaving group, all of these went quite a bit faster. It looks like just from what you can see here, we had quite a bit of precipitate within our 1-bromobutane, our 2-bromobutane, our benzyl chloride, and our 2-chloro-2-methylpropane. Since we didn't see this in real time though, you can't actually rank them just based on what you see. So after 10 minutes of room temperature, we put the, the solutions which only had a small amount of precipitate or no precipitate on the um, hot water bath, the same as we did for the SN2 reactions. So let's go ahead and jump right over to the rankings for these compounds. So for our terp butyl chloride, you could see from that, from the end of that video, that we had some precipitate form immediately. So that was actually the fastest to react. Uh, that one had precipitate form right when we had dropped that in, and that's essentially when we took the screenshot of that video. So our terp butyl chloride was most reactive, um, and that formed quite a bit of precipitate within the next even 10 seconds from the video snapshot that you saw. The second quickest was our 2-bromobutane. Again, all of this was simply based on cloudiness, and I already essentially have a short explanation for exactly what was seen and the specific times related to that within your observations. So for this results table, what I think you should do is read those one more time, so get comfortable with essentially what was seen in the experiment, and then also go ahead and fill this out. So the names of several of the compounds are missing, so make sure to include that in your table. All right, so let's talk about the specific mechanism for the SN1 reaction. This is a little bit different than what you've seen in your text because in your text you don't usually see something assisting helping that leaving group leave. Usually you just see the leaving group leave, which is certainly possible um, for several of these compounds that essentially just spread the rate up also, the most important thing and the reason why we use this is because once our leaving group left, it was bound to silver and that silver halide is insoluble in solution. So that is what we're actually looking at. That's the precipitate that we saw in solution when we were analyzing the reaction rates for SN1 reactions. So looking at the mechanism for this, we have our substrate with our leaving group on it and we have our silver nitrate in solution. This is a salt. Our silver has a positive charge. Our nitrate has a negative charge. Our halogen is going to bind to the silver making that a better leaving group. So now our halogen, our X, which is either a bromine or a chlorine is bound to the silver, making that a better leaving group. So now our leaving group will leave, will form our carbocation intermediate. 
the precipitate forms, that we're, that's what we're seeing to see the rate. Now, our strongest nucleophile in solution is also our solvent, which you'll often see for SN1 reactions. In this case, our ethanol is forming a dual purpose. It is our nucleophile and it is our solvent. We have a lot of it, which is why this is what's going to be the primary reagent to attack our carbocation intermediate. It's also our nucleophile, so we're going to do a nucleophilic attack on that carbocation intermediate to get us to here. So this is not the end because we still have a positive charge, a relatively unstable compound. Additional ethanol in solution can then deprotonate that to form our final product, in this case our ether in solution, as well as our byproduct. So essentially as this reaction goes, we're going to have more and more acid byproduct as the reaction continues. So looking at this, let's look at one, well, we're actually going to look at a couple examples here. So first let's look at our um, our benzyl chloride. So for benzyl chloride, when we have that in solution with our silver nitrate, our AgNO3, based on the mechanism, we've got our chlorine binding to the silver to get us to our intermediate, which is silver bound to our chlorine leaving group, and now we have a positive charge on that chlorine leaving group. In your textbook, it's often said that your leaving group will not leave, so you'll form a primary carbocation intermediate, which is true. Um, but the reason why it's okay in this case is because it's actually only a resonance contributor for another one. So let's go ahead and combine the resonance contributor with the leaving group leaving so we don't form that primary carbocation intermediate. So these electrons here can move there. That can then essentially kick off our leaving group. And that'll get us to our resonance contributor. And I'm going to draw this down here. Now we have a double bond there. This carbon here is this carbon here, that's neutral. But we do have a positive charge on that carbon there. We still have our double bonds there and there. So this is one of our resonance contributors. This is a secondary carbocation intermediate resonance contributor. And we actually have quite a few more resonance contributors. So we have another resonance contributor if we move these electrons here to form that. We've got a positive charge there, our double bond is there, we still have a double bond there, and still have a double bond there. From here, we can move these, that double bond there to form this contributor. So now we have a positive charge there, our double bond is there, and there, and there. And finally, we're going to get to the last one, which is the least substantial contributor. But for this, so once we move this, our only other option to form another contributor is moving these electrons from this double bond here down to there, which means that we now have reformed our aromatic ring. We have a double bond there and there and there. And this is now a single bond, and that is our positive charge. So looking at our all of our resonance contributors, this is the least substantial. So that's our that is essentially going to contribute the least, meaning that our partial positive charge isn't going to be sitting there for very long. But this is the carbocation intermediate. If you were showing it in a mechanism, it would be easiest to show that our nucleophile would attack because that aromatic ring would want to be reformed. So if you want to show ethanol coming into attack, there's nothing wrong with showing this, and you can essentially show your ethanol coming in to do a nucleophilic attack on that carbon, which would get you to essentially this intermediate. You then have one more step for a proton transfer. So looking at this, this is a primary substrate. In your textbook, I'm sure that it says that a primary substrate will never undergo an SN1 reaction. Well, in this case, our carbocation intermediate is supported by resonance contributors. 
So we have a relatively stable carbocation intermediate, even though initially looking at this, we have a primary substrate, which again, your textbook says never happens. The reason why this is happening is because we have stabilized that carbocation intermediate by resonance. So in your textbook, they make it somewhat black and white, but you really got to think about all the different variables there. The carbocation, the primary carbocation is relatively unstable. There's no doubt about that, but there are things that can, that can stabilize it. So it's not always that it's not going to go. And for one more example of that, let's look at our 1-chloro-2-methyl-propane starting material. That also went relatively fast based on the results, faster than we would have expected because, again, we have a, our substrate on a primary carbon. So for this, we are going to start out the same way. So we have our silver nitrate. We've got our chlorine attacking that silver. And that's going to get us to our intermediate, which is chlorine attached to silver. And now we have a plus charge there. Again, in your textbook, it says usually you don't want to form that primary carbocation, and that's what would have to happen if that leaving group were to just leave. So we often combine that, if possible, with a 1-2 hydride shift, where we can do our 1-2 hydride shift, which will essentially kick off our leaving group, getting us to our carbocation intermediate which looks like that. So that carbocation intermediate is a tertiary carbocation intermediate, which is pretty stable. So it's not as stable as the fastest to react because we can't just have the leaving group leave to form that. We have to also do the 1-2 hydride shift, which takes a little bit more energy to actually perform that reaction. So it's not surprising this is slower, but our intermediate is actually equally as stable as the fastest to react are tert butyl chloride. So if when thinking about your reaction uh, one more time, so if we have one bromobutane, this is a primary substrate, you, so you would normally say it's impossible, but make sure if you think about that mechanism and talk about why this did actually go, you should also talk about the 1-2 hydride shift essentially allowing this to form a secondary carbocation instead of a primary carbocation intermediate for your order of reactivity. So I've shown an example here of a 1-2 hydride shift, which is often referred to as a rearrangement in your textbook. So a rearrangement happened to stabilize our carbocation intermediate. So I talked about resonance here, resonance, so there are essentially four, there are four resonance contributors for our carbocation intermediate of our benzyl chloride substrate. So that is essentially what sped up this reaction. Um, what I have not talked about is stability of the leaving group. So essentially if we've got bromine, that's going to happen faster than chlorine. So looking back at this again, immediately we have a tertiary substrate here. This is expected to be the fastest to react. We have a great leaving group, and we would immediately form a secondary substrate on this. So that's a pretty quick reaction too. Even though we're starting out with a primary substrate, we actually have resonance stability. So what we really have is three secondary carbocations and a primary carbocation rather than at first glance you would just see okay we've got a primary carbocation this isn't going to happen it is and it's going to happen fast because we actually have resonance stability essentially giving the equivalent of three secondary carbocation intermediates here even though we have a primary substrate we have a great leaving group and we have one two hydride shift potential here we have one two hydride shift potential forming a tertiary substrate so you can justify this as being slower than this because the bromine is a more stable leaving group. Even though we're binding it to silver, still, even with that, this is more ready to leave because this bond between the bromine and carbon is weaker. This bromine can handle that negative charge more easily because of the size of the atom. Here we've got our 2-chlorobutane. That is going to be the third slowest. We did see a little bit of precipitate form because we are forming a secondary substrate, and then 1-chlorobutane was the slowest to react. Even though it has the 1-2 hydride shift potential, we're still on initially a primary carbon. And with that 1-2 hydride shift, we're only forming a secondary substrate.